I've been talking about the soul the last couple of weeks. We, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the parable of the soul, of the soul, of the soul and talked about soul fatigue. Last week, we talked about how to remedy a sick, tired soul. How many of you practiced what we preached last week? How many of you built the fire and looked at a strange? John, you even look refreshed. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you just found time to do nothing? Let me see your hand. Just a, just a little bit. You had a chance to just, did, did it, wasn't it good? Was it good? Just do, just do nothing. The most spiritual thing some of us could do is nothing. And uh, th this may seem kind of backwards, but I, I told you what the cure is, but, and I did give you some consequences, but I want to get deeper into this thing about our soul. I want to talk with you We'll start this morning with, 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 a, with a kind of a little mini-series entitled The Negative Power of a Sick Soul. The Negative Power of a Sick Soul. Now I want you to turn me to James chapter 1. Brother Les, thank you for that ministry. Amen. You can tell he loves Jesus. Amen. James chapter 1. Verse 21. The word says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your what? Your souls. And then in Psalm 19, 7, hold your finger there in James, turn to Psalm 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. I mean, you know, the law of the Lord is the word of the Lord. Amen. What James just told us to receive with meekness. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, I want you to understand something. James is not speaking to lost people about not going to hell. When he says in James 1.21, Receive the engrafted word of God. that your soul might be saved. He's not talking about lost people. He's not talking to lost people. He's telling Christians, he's telling believers that their souls need to be saved. Look at verse 2. My brethren counted all joy. So he's not talking to the lost world. He's talking to brethren. And he said, hey brethren, some of you are saved. You could be saved, but your minds are wrecked. We got anybody like that here today? <laughs> when the word talks about in Proverbs the converting of the soul the law of the Lord converts the soul the writer of Proverbs is affirming the fact that our souls need to be, the word in the Hebrew is refreshed, restored and turned around your soul is your mind your emotions and your will we are a tripart being just like God is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Man is a tripart being too because we're made in the image of God. We are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, the Apostle Paul tells the people at Thessalonica, he says, I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of the Lord. He didn't just say your body. He didn't just say your spirit. He said, I want your mind to be blameless. I want your soul to be, your suke, your mind, emotions, and will. Now, when the Bible tells you that you have a lost soul that needs to be saved or converted, lost soul is not a cosmic destination. It is a clinical diagnosis. You're sick. The church is full of people with saved spirits and sick souls. Can I get an amen? amen? There are Christians all over this land that are on their way to heaven, but living like hell in a torture chamber between their ears. Their spirit is saved, but their soul is a wreck. 
Psalm, uh, the Proverbs 23, 7 says, As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And that word heart there is the same word used in Genesis where, Gen where, where God says that Adam became a living soul. As we think in our soul, how I many you know we don't think with our heart? How I many of you know we don't think with our heart? <laughs> our heart pumps blood. It's an organ. We think with our mind. We think with our soul. And as a man thinketh, so is he. That means if you have a sick thought life, you're a sick woman or man. That means if you have sick beliefs, you're a sick woman or man mentally. Your soul is sick. If you have sick attitudes that are contrary to the word of God, it means that you have a sick soul. And a sick soul has power. That's why I entitled this message, The Negative Power of a Sick Soul. A sick soul has power. Just as a well soul can produce good, positive results in your life, a sick soul can produce negative, bad things in your life. And there are many things a sick soul can make you. And today we're going to start by talking about the first thing. A sick soul can make you feel lost. A sick soul can make you feel lost. Turn with me to Psalm 13. Psalm 13. 1 and 2. Psalm 13, 1 and 2. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my what? My soul. How long will you forget me? How many of you, though you were saved, at times you have felt God has left me? God has abandoned me. Let me give you a little test. A sick soul will make you feel lost. How many of you have ever been rebaptized? How many of you have ever reprayed the sinner's prayer every single time Billy Graham was on television? Just in case it didn't take the first time. Can I see your hand? See, now I want you to hold your hands up high because, see, you ain't by yourself. The devil took you the only one that's down to your salvation. I'm going to tell you, you're looking at a preacher that was baptized three times. I've been baptized three times. Two of them bats. <laughs> they were. <laughs> Most likely, if you have reprayed the sinner's prayer a hundred times, come on, I know I'm talking to somebody up there. <laughs> <laughs> Most likely, that was because you had a sick soul, not a lost spirit. That's right. Come on. I mean, if you ask, he came in. If you believe, he did his part. He's not playing cat and mouse with us. Well, you didn't say the right thing. Let's do it again. <laughs> you said thing you should have said that. <laughs> you didn't remember what you prayed. I mean, you all struggle with that. Well, I don't even remember what I prayed. I don't remember. I don't remember. Maybe I didn't say the right thing. <laughs> did I have to say it? What did I say? When did I say it? Was I really under the conviction of the Holy Ghost? I'm going to tell you what, the Holy Spirit is not going to convict you and you obey and God's like, whoop, nope, just teasing. <laughs> you didn't say it right. You left out a word. Do you know there's no sinner's prayer in the Bible? Anyone? Let's move on. <laughs> this thing about feeling lost because you got a sick soul. A sick soul will accuse you will we'll accuse God of forgetting you when he's promised us that we are ever on his mind. The psalmist said, how long will you forget me? But God hasn't forgotten you. God's promised us that we're ever on, he says we're engraved in the palm of his hand. So every morning when he reaches over to make that sun rise up, bless God, he sees me. He can't forget me. A sick soul will accuse God of hiding his face from us when he has promised that he'll always be near to those that seek him. Most of the times, God's a lot closer to you than you think he is. Amen. And when he seems the farthest away, that's when he's the closest. You know, it wasn't Adam going out looking for 
with God. We said, well, I found the Lord. You ain't found nothing. He wasn't lost. <laughs> you was the lost one. He found you. In the Garden of Eden, it wasn't Adam said, where are you, God? It was God saying, Adam, get out behind that tree and spit that apple out. Even though it probably wasn't an apple. I think it was a fig. You know why I think it was a fig? Because men are bad about going back to the same place they messed up to try to get fixed. Ooh. Put them fig leaves on us on our own be all right. Messed up eating the fig, so we're gonna fix it by wearing some fig leaves. I mean, things in your life, if you tried to fix and you went back to the same cesspool you got messed up in to try to fix your situation. Well, maybe, maybe that next life will be the right one. <laughs> maybe that one more drink. Maybe one more affair. Maybe one more pill. Well, that's not in my notes. A sick soul will base the security of your salvation on changing circumstances around you. There's days I don't feel very saved. I don't know about y'all. Y'all might be more holy than I am. Maybe y'all need to be up here. Because there's days I just don't feel holy. There's days I don't want to act holy. There's days I just feel like, God, where are you? Am I the only one in here that feels that way? I mean, as long as your tires on high there, you got more, you know, money in your, in your bank account than you got bills in the mailbox, you feel pretty saved. Circumstances change, but it don't change your salvation. That's right. A sick soul can accuse God of forsaking us simply because we may have forsaken Him. <coughs> There's not one of us here today that hasn't forsaken God during some time of our walk with Him. You know why we doubt and think we're lost and doubt our salvation? Because we're afraid that he's going to be just as unfaithful to us as we've been to him. If that was so, we'd all already be in hell, y'all. His faithfulness to me is unconditional. And never one time have I gone back to him with my form letter forgiveness prayer. Y'all got any one of them? <laughs> form letter forgiveness, same thing, same thing, same thing. Not once as he said, all right, this is the last time. I'm so thankful he's faithful to me when I'm not faithful to him. Amen. That's no excuse not to be faithful. But it is reason not to doubt your salvation when you know that he saved you. Here's what I have found. Listen to this. A sick soul will believe a devil who's never told the truth while doubting a God who's never told a lie. Mm -hmm. Why do we have such an easy time believing everything the devil tells us? And it's a struggle to believe God. And God's never told me a single lie. He can't lie, and the devil can't tell the truth. If you believe God less than you believe Satan, you've got a sick soul. There's a second thing that a sick soul can make you. Not only will a sick soul make you feel lost, a sick soul can make you hate yourself. The church is full of people carrying self-hatred. Look at me in Job 10, 1. Right before the book of Psalm. Job 10, verse 1. Job says, Job says, my soul loathes my life. I will give free course to my complaint. Now that's one scripture a lot of us practice. <laughs> giving free course to our complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. What Job was saying is, I hate myself. The word loathe there means to feel intense dislike or disgust for, intolerance, or to detest. And many Christians suffer from self-hatred. 
Remember when Jesus commanded us to love our neighbor as ourself? For some of us, that's our problem. We hate ourselves and we hate our neighbor and think we're being scriptural. <laughs> Brennan Manning said this in his book, A Glimpse of Jesus. We cannot accept love nor give love to another human being when we do not love ourselves, much less believe that God could possibly love us. You see, self-hatred begins with a distorted view of God caused by a sick soul. 360 years ago, I wasn't there, Les was. <laughs> 360 years ago, Blaise Pascal wrote this. Now listen to this. Blaise Pascal wrote this. God made man in his own image and man returned the compliment. What does that mean? It means we have ascribed to God our own attitudes and feelings about us. We believe that God feels toward us like we feel toward us because of self-hatred. Now, why do we hate ourselves? Some of you have asked that question. Why do I hate myself? I want you to listen to this closely. This will be some stuff that will help you if you'll hear this. Teenagers, listen. Children's shirts, listen. This can save you some hell and, and, and problems that some of us grown people with torture chambers between our ears have had to endure for the last 30 years. Why do people hate themselves? Why do we hate ourselves? It's because we were born with a sense of justice. Listen, we were born with a sense of justice. Buddhist you know, the one that's got the God that looks like me. <laughs> Buddhists call it karma. And I was watching a documentary on Netflix yesterday about the island or the, the country of Burma. The country of Burma, the, one of the most isolated countries in the world. And they're all Buddhists. And they believe that what they're going through right now, being poor and homeless and diseased, is punishment for mistakes they made in their previous life because they believe in reincarnation. And they even said that if you're mean to a dog, you will come back in your next life as a dog and somebody will be even more mean to you. There's a sense of justice. Justice is going to be done. Now, how does that relate to us? Every one of us here, please hear this. Every one of us here, we've seen our sin. We know what we do in the dark, Brother Les. Let me say this. What you do in the dark is a sum total of who you are. Nothing less and nothing more. You are who you are in the dark. No more, no less. When we think nobody sees us, we know our sin. We know the thoughts we think. We know the things we do and keep saying, God, I'm never going to do it again. Or I hope nobody ever knows I ever did that. Or they won't want to be my friend. We know what it's like to live in the dark place of our sin. We know who we are in the dark where no one sees. And our sense of justice tells us this. It's not okay to wipe the slate clean. It is not okay to get away with what I've done. We believe that we must pay for our sin. You see, we've all got a little Buddhist in us. i got to pay for my sin. I screwed up, man, bad. Now i got to show God and everybody else how sorry I am by beating the hell out of myself. We refuse to allow God's love in because it wouldn't be fair. He should not love me for what I've done. He should not love me for what I've fought. It's not fair and just for him to wipe away what I've done. 
he's not going to be just, then I will be. My judgment's better than his. And if he won't hate me for what I've done, I'll hate myself. Listen. That's why we hate ourselves. Jesus, I know you love me, but that's not fair. Because i got to pay. I'll bet you 95% of Christians in the world that they live with a self-hatred self attitude, believing that they could, they've got to they do the blood of Jesus plus. We add to the blood of Jesus because it just seems too good to be true. We hate ourselves to the point that we say, God, if you won't judge me like I need to be, I'll judge myself. And not only will I hate myself for the rest of my life and make me miserable, I'm going to make every cotton pick in every body that ever enters my life be miserable with me. Come on, son. We choose to live under a cloud of judgment of a sick soul rather than an umbrella of grace of a sacrificial Savior. Well, let that sink in. It's been said that a serious Christian ought to love what God loves and hate what God hates. Romans 5, 8 through 11 says that while I was yet a sinner, Jesus loved me and gave his life for me. Romans, Romans chapter 5, 8 through 11. While I was still a sinner, Jesus loved me and gave his life for me. So what does it say about we ought to love what Jesus loves and hate what Jesus hates? If a serious Christian believes that, a, that, that serious Christians love what God loves and hates what God hates, listen, how serious of a Christian are we when we hate what God loves? How can you hate yourself when God loved you before you were his child? And nothing you do will make him love you any less. How serious are we, brothers and sisters, to say we love what God loves and hate what God hates when we hate the very thing that's been made in the image of God mm -hmm. ourselves? Mm -hmm. Come on, preacher. And think that our judgment is more right than God Almighty's. I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. The judgment that should have been on every one of us was placed on Jesus at the cross, and he said he was finished. Give the Lord a praise. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's not Jesus plus church membership. Jesus plus water baptism. Jesus plus reading the Bible. Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus! Amen. Once you add anything to Jesus, you frustrate the grace of God, Paul said. We frustrate the grace of God by performance-based acceptance. Believing that God just accepts me when I'm performing well. Your boss might be that way. Your spouse might be that way. But it means he says, he's already made me accepted in the beloved. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Finally, there's a third thing we're going to look at this morning. The power, the negative power of Sick soul. A sick soul can make you feel lost. A sick soul can make you hate yourself. Thirdly, this morning, a sick soul can make you look downcast. Romans, excuse me, Proverbs 15, 13. Proverbs 15, 13. A sick soul can make you look downcast. Proverbs 15, 13. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. The word in the Hebrew there for heart in both places means mind, intellect, or will. So we could say a merry soul makes a cheerful countenance. But by the sorrow of the soul, the spirit is broken. And then look at me in Psalm 42, 11. 
Go to the right. Psalm 42, 11. Excuse me, go to the left unless it's changed and moved in your body. Psalm 42, <laughs> Psalm 42, 11. Psalm 42, 11. Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance. Your countenance is how you look. It's your face, your eyes. Why are you cast down, O oh, my soul? My sick soul? Why are you sick? God, help my countenance. Lift up my countenance. You see, a sick soul can make you look downcast. It affects your outward appearance. It affects your countenance. Listen, all the makeup in the world cannot disguise a sick soul. There's not enough Maybelline, Mary Kay, Clairol. You ain't gonna cover it up. You can look at a person's face. And it's like an x-ray or an MRI of the life they lived. I'm trying not to look at anybody too long. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen somebody that sin just imprinted or indelible lines on their face? I don't know what I'm talking about. You don't know them from Adam, but you can look at them and say, Burn. <laughs> They've been real hard to put up with. <laughs> they didn't iron the wrinkles out of that. <laughs> My Lord. And you know their life ain't been a bowl of cherries. Indelible lives. they got a cast down soul. Worry will put lines on your face. Anxiety will droop your droop your sorry, droop your drawers, but droop your <laughs> jaws. <laughs> Aren't we transparent today? <laughs> Rejection. Inferiority. And depression. All these things cause you to have a cast down soul. Now our parents try to warn us. Our parents told us, your face is going to freeze that way. And my parents, some of ours did. <laughs> Do you know some people that, according to their countenance, you think if they ever smile, they're going to be like that guy in that congestion commercial on TV. Their face is just going to fall off on the table. <laughs> just going to crack and fall. They can't smile. You can look at a person's face and it also is an x-ray or an MRI of the thoughts they've been thinking. You that have been through the marriage retreat, this is a refresher course. A person's countenance, is everybody listening? A person's countenance reflects the wounds that words have caused and can cause. A person's countenance reflects the wounds that words can cause or have caused. And I'm going to speak to the men. It's equally true for the women, but I am not a woman. So I'm going to speak to the men from a, from a husband's perspective. Your wife's countenance is simply nothing more, nothing less. Your wife's countenance is a reflection of your ministry or lack thereof to her soul. Why are you always so sad? And she wants to say, you. <laughs> you need a little 
doing more makeup this morning. You? The moon has no shining ability. It simply reflects the sun. And if your wife this morning has a downcast countenance, it's because of the wounds that you have given her by your words. Her countenance is a reflection of your ministry or lack thereof to her soul. One more pretty wife. I can immediately see on Anne's face the moment I have wounded her. And guess what, guys? When you see that countenance drop, it's too late to say, delete, delete, control alt, delete, redo, redo, redo. Because it's done. It's done. The moment I wound her, with my words, I see her countenance fall. By the power, the negative power of my words. And see, at that moment, it isn't her with the sick soul, it's me. Mm -hmm. I can also immediately see her on her face when I washed her with my words. And her countenance lifts up. That's when I feel like a man. Paul said, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself for her, and cleansed her by the washing of water of the word. Your wife can't cleanse herself. Anymore. You see the parallel between Jesus and the church and a husband and his wife? Could I wash myself before Jesus came along? I was wrinkled, spotted. I couldn't help myself. Jesus came. And how did he cleanse me? What did he wash me with? His word. What did he wash me with? His word. He made me a spotless bride in his sight because he washed me with his word when I could not wash myself. And he says, husbands, is your bride wrinkled, spotted, dirty? You need to wash her with your words. We wash our bride the same way Jesus washed his. With our words. Now this is not in the Bible, but your eyes truly are the windows of your soul. And when you've got a downcast spirit, a downcast soul, you can't hide it. Let me ask you something. When somebody looks into your eyes this morning, what do they see? What is the condition of the soul that's behind those eyes? What story about your life does your face tell every time somebody looks at you? You can't hide it. God created us to recognize and interpret facial expressions. He created us to do that. What is it that we always see when we look up in the clouds? A face. There's this funny looking little rug in front of our commode. And when I am sitting there, yes, I do, I see faces. I see dead people. I see faces. <laughs> uh, 
When we look at abstract things, our mind is created to see a face. That's how God made our brain. Study it, really. This isn't maniology. This is true. And it is so we recognize one another. I don't remember names, but I never forget a face. I've seen people I've seen since junior high, and they will look like me, very different. And I don't know who they were. I, I, I don't know their name necessarily, but we went to school together. Now, what story does your face tell when people see you? This morning, Julie, if you come. You might be one that has struggled with security of your salvation and feeling lost. You might be one that suffers from self-hatred and you just think that God's deal to you was just too good and better than you deserve. May I say it, 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 it is and it was. But let's not trample the blood of Jesus underfoot by saying I'm going to have to add to what you did, Jesus, because you just weren't mean enough to me. You let me off too easy. You wiped the slate clean. And no, 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 bad Jesus. Because I need to suffer and pay for what I did. It was so terrible. And I'm just not going to let myself get away with that. You didn't get away with it, my darling. Your beating was placed upon him. There's a thing called double jeopardy. You can't be tried for the same thing twice. You can't be electrocuted for the same thing twice. Jesus already took your beat and took your death. And if you have a hard time believing that and forgiving yourself, you've got a sick soul and you need to run down here and say, God, forgive me for trying to be the co-savior of my life. I want you to stand. You might be here today and your soul might be cast down. You'd like to come to this altar and say, I'm going to hope in God. So why are you cast down? You've got a Savior. You've got one that has a word that's able to renew your mind. And I don't care what words have ever been spoken against you. There's one with a word that trumps everything ever been said against you. And it's the one that says something for you. This altar's open right now. I'm not going to stand here like Billy Graham. And I'm not going to plead with you and give you no emotional appeal. But if today, either point of this message dealt with you and you want to come and seal this thing and say, God, I received that.